It's great to be here. Thank you all for letting me speak to you. Uh, MJ invited me because I'm an expert on John Crawford. She knew that. Not, <laughs> never heard of the guy. <laughs> but now I am an expert thanks to Rich. Because everything I'm going to tell you, Rich Beals told me. So I, I'm just kind of distilling it down. So to, I'm the pack of lies. Yes, so you're so, yeah, any questions about what I have to say? Dr. Rich. Uh, Rich has been a great friend and colleague over the years, uh, contributed in a major way to uh, this historical CPC that we put on here at campus, and plus uh, many of the uh, articles that I've written that have, have to do with the history of medicine. Uh, it's a particular pleasure for me to give this presentation because some of the best hours of my career I've spent at this library and its predecessors. Uh, this library uh, has been in no small way uh, responsible for the modest successes I've had in, in writing things. And uh, so I just feel, have a very warm feeling uh, for the library and, and uh, a, a tremendous sense of gratitude for being able to uh, speak to you about the father of our library. So let me say, uh, amplify a little bit uh, what you've already heard from MJ about uh, our, our library. Um, it began, as, as you've heard, uh, with the acquisition of the Crawford Collection in uh, 1813. There were, uh, in the particular collection that was bought, there were 679 volumes. And that was not the whole collection because uh, documents from uh, Crawford's daughter who sold the university of the collection indicate that some of the uh, volumes were lost, some of them had uh, found their uh, way elsewhere. Uh, there were uh, people who borrowed them and then never returned them. You probably never heard of that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so at, at $500 for the entire collection, uh, this came out to about 11, well that's not right, I'm sorry, <laughs> let, me, let me put it a different way. $500 in 1813 is the equivalent of $7,500 today. So in, in today's dollars, the university bought this collection for $11.05 a volume. A, an unbelievable steal, and I'll get back to that. Uh, they, they took uh, uh, Dr. Crawford's daughter for a real ride on this thing. Uh, uh, but she was desperate because, as you see, when he, he died, he was destitute and really had nothing else to, to leave his family. So uh, the collection, as you've heard, uh, is, uh, was one of, the, uh, one of the largest, most impressive, certainly in Maryland, it was, uh, and may have been in the country at that time. Um, it's just a wonderful collection of, of uh, books uh, uh, by Borhoff, uh, Benet, Charles Benet, interesting person, I won't get into that, you probably haven't heard of him, but also Galen, Hippocrates, Linnaeus, Malpighi, Priestley, Waterhouse, who was in Boston at the time, and this was a current volume, uh, and Withering of uh, Digitalis fame. So um, these books covered a whole array of topics as well as errors. Uh, they were very old, as in uh, Hippocrates. Obviously, this was not a first edition. Uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, they reflect the fact that uh, Crawford was interested in history, the history of medicine, but also um, remaining current in terms of concepts of medicine, um, as evidenced by the, uh, the uh, most recent books he bought. Now, he died in 1813, and the most recent volume that we have in the collection uh, was published in 1811. So he was not just a collector of books, he actually read what he collected. And these books uh, represented some six languages, English, uh, French, Italian, German, Dutch, and Latin. And presumably, 
because he, he refers to uh, the information in these books liberally in the, in the things he wrote. He was conversant in uh, all these languages. Uh, the subjects covered did not just include medicine, and so maybe he had a vision of a health sciences library as opposed to a medical library, because there are uh, books in the collection uh, that deal with uh, pharmacy, pharmaceuticals, dentistry, nursing, and botany. And uh, this book you see here is the oldest in the collection. It's the Kreuter book, and it was actually published in 1565. So that's the oldest. I think there, there's probably some other volumes uh, that date back to that time. But, so uh, 1565 to 1811, tremendous uh, collection, tremendous acquisition by the university. And yet, by 1891, when uh, one of our uh, uh, graduates, he was not a graduate, as you'll see, of, of this medical school, a uh, Dr. T. Burton Broon donated uh, 1,200 volumes to the, uh, to the library. Poor old Dr. Crawford's collection was subsumed under this, uh, this uh, group of books and came to be referred to as the Broon Collection. So, um, Dr. Gerald, think about that and your, your wonderful sculpture next door. It'll probably be named in honor of somebody else in you know, <laughs> years or so. So you better, you know, sign it legibly. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, all right, so, so that is, that's this, uh, this Crawford collection that was purchased in 1830, 13. Uh, from his daughter. He was already, uh, he had already died at that time. Um, so who was he? And was there more to this man than his collection? Should we, should we revere him for things other than uh, just these books that we were able to purchase? So here he is. He was born in Northern Ireland, in Ireland in uh, 1746, died in Baltimore on May 9th, uh, 1813. He was 67 at the time, buried in uh, Westminster uh, Church Cemetery just up the street, and we're going to visit that as soon as we're finished here. Son of a clergyman, and uh, that uh, upbringing uh, in a religious household affected his later view of the world, in particular of medicine and disease. He thought that, uh, based on that upbringing, that everything that happened to us was due to an interaction uh, of God's creatures with each other and also with the uh, human um, population. He uh, received his undergraduate training at Trinity College in Dublin and then uh, received a um, MD of sorts uh, at the University of Leiden. Uh, there he came in contact with traditional teaching such as that that was professed uh, over a century earlier by Paracelsus that uh, was, a, um, was a variant of the humoral theory, black bile, yellow bile, blood and phlegm and how they interacted and became uh, disjointed to, to cause disease and also uh, the influence of atmospheric uh, things in, in uh, producing uh, disease. Uh, after he graduated, he, uh, a major part of his clinical uh, work was conducted in uh, tropical areas. First, uh, with the East India Company, where he made uh, at least two trips to India, Bombay, Southern India, tropics, uh, and then uh, he was uh, a surgeon at the Naval Hospital in Barbados. Uh, and then finally, and most importantly, in 1790, he was surgeon major uh, in uh, Demerara, uh, which is now Guiana, uh, 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 where he, uh, he did most of his clinical work and made most of his, his uh, clinical observations, including many, many uh, autopsies. And in the process of, of seeing these diseases and doing the autopsies, it just occurred to him that this idea that all these things that he saw when he uh, dissected people were due to a disruption 
of these four humors just, just didn't make sense. And so he uh, came up with his own theory, which I'll get to in a minute, based on his observations in the tropics. So uh, in 1796, before the medical school was founded or before his library uh, was purchased, uh, he comes to Baltimore on the advice of his brother-in-law, who was a successful businessman here in town. Why exactly he decided to do that is not clear. Well, and by the way, what he died of, I, I could not find. Rich, maybe that'll be a project for us in the future. So uh, he's in Baltimore for 17 years before he dies. And listen to what he, uh, what he accomplished uh, during that period. So he, he developed a close relationship where there are multiple letters going back and forth between him and Benjamin Rush, who was in Philadelphia and was the most prominent physician in the U.S. at the time. So he's been, you know, he's been down the tropics here and there. He comes to Baltimore and within a very short time. He's developed this relationship. And these are intimate letters uh, going back and forth. For 13 years, he, during the 17-year period, he was the Grand Master of the Masonic Order of Maryland. He founded the Society for Promoting Useful Knowledge. He served as chairman of the medical faculty of Baltimore and vice president of the Baltimore Medical Society. 17 years, not a good old this. Helped to establish the Bible Society in Baltimore, the Baltimore Public Library, the Baltimore General Dispensary, I have to say forerunner of our, our own uh, medical uh, institution, uh, uh, and the Maryland State Penitentiary. I mean, how, it's, it's just amazing what he did to. And then in addition to all that, he was an advisor to the State Board of Health. Um, he spent uh, a great deal of effort trying to convince them that a Board of Health should have a physician representation. Because you see, there were no physicians on that board. That may have been a good thing. I don't know. I, I'm not here to pass judgment. I'm just reporting the facts as Rich gave me to me. Um, so in 1811, he was briefly a member of the faculty. I say briefly because he gave this lecture uh, of which our library has a copy uh, and then uh, apparently uh, never had any other uh, association with the university. Uh, and uh, at that time, he wrote Rush saying the following, uh, his introductory lecture was poorly received. <laughs> and that was the last we ever heard of him, although he gave, he gave lectures at his home. I'm going to get back to that lecture because that's key uh, to, uh, to uh, who he was and uh, how things happen to happen uh, to him. All right, so moving on. So um, academic institutions are always looking for heroes. Uh, in their history uh, to present to the public to, uh, to uh, verify uh, their, their bona fides, you know, and their, their credibility. Hopkins has been a master of this. And this is one of their gods. Uh, Hopkins, we are, I, I, I want to say right up front that Hopkins, uh, we're very lucky to have them in Baltimore. Fabulous institution, and we've both been been better uh, because uh, of our, our association in the same town. I, I, having said that, I'm not a fan of this deification of Osler. However, um, I mentioned him for a number of reasons. Uh, like Crawford, he was a bibliophile. He collected books. He had a huge library, which he uh, donated uh, to uh, McGill. He founded multiple societies. They were all medical. This is different from uh, Crawford, who had, had uh, medical as well as non-medical societies that he uh, was involved in, uh, sometimes founding and sometimes uh, just a, a major player in. Um, but unlike Crawford, he also produced a textbook which basically changed the whole manner in which medical textbooks were written. It was a, a seminal event. He was an educator extraordinaire, and, and his, 
His deification in large part is due to um, the adulation uh, that his trainees directed toward him and maintained uh, for generations afterwards. And perhaps most importantly, he was a lucid and prolific, or let me put it the other way around, a prolific but also a lucid writer. Uh, Crawford was prolific but the opposite of lucid, and I'll, I'll get back to that. So um, Maryland is long to have its, its own pantheon of heroes. And we have some real heroes, some in the making. Uh, Dr. Woodward, we are, I've already heard of. And, and I could go on ad nauseum. The question is, is Crawford a worthy member of the Maryland pantheon? Now here's what, here's what has been written about him in sort of short uh, biographical sketches. Eugene Cordell, who was a former librarian, was he chief librarian? Yes. Chief librarian wrote in uh, 1907 of uh, Crawford, one of the most remarkable men ever connected with our school. We can hardly blame his fellow physicians for rejecting his teachings as visionary, for their eyes were closed. <laughs> wow. Another, well ahead of his time with his thinking, his theories unfortunately would not receive proper acceptance until well after his death. And then correctly predicted the relationship between insects and human diseases. Now this is big time stuff. Um, conceived of the germ theory, while residing in South America. Mort, come on, that sounds reasonable, doesn't it? Re conceived of the germ theory. Uh, and I'm not making this up, uh, Rich gave it to me. So. <laughs> uh, first American to administer smallpox vaccine. Just make a mental note of this, because I'm gonna get back to this lost all his business by propagating an unpopular theory in medicine. Another way to say that is he was a martyr to the truth. He became destitute because he wouldn't uh, deal with anything but the truth. So the um, question is, what was his unpopular theory? Why was it rejected? Did it cause his medical practice to to fold. Was he the first American to administer smallpox vaccine? All right, let's, let's deal with that. So um, his, uh, theory, his theory on, um, on uh, diseases um, is based on, as I've already implied, both, to, both his uh, religious background uh, and his experience in the tropics. So um, in, in one particular passage, he talks about, as he's in the tropics, um, he notices as the sun is setting and the, the light is coming in at a bleak angle, at a distance, he can, see, uh, he can see swarms of insects. No seams. You know what no seams are? They bite the hell out of you, but you can't see them, so they're called no seams. <laughs> and that's, that's what we're seeing here. And so he's, he's thinking to himself, he's thinking, well, I can see them out there because that's where the light is. But I can't see them here, but I know they're here. It's just the light is not proper. So that um, they must be all around me. I must be breathing them in. They're the reason why. I found what I found in all those autopsies and sick people in the tropics. They got into the body and they're causing the disease. So he, he, in, in specific terms, here what, here's what he says, encapsulizing his theory. Plague, yellow fever, and every other fever, and every other disease we experience must be occasions occasioned by eggs insinuated without our knowledge into our bodies, externally or internally, or from eggs placed near our habitations, which when hatched, in either case, prey upon us by parts. So when he's talking about insect eggs, 
This is not a metaphorical statement. He's talking about eggs of insects. And when he talks about worms, he's not talking about, he's not uh, speaking abstractly about viruses or bacteria. He's talking about worms causing everything. So that, that's it. Um, so interesting theory. And uh, you can understand why people might not accept it. Uh, however, it was neither new nor necessarily unacceptable at the time. In uh, 600 BC, so that's 2,500 years earlier, Lucius Junius Moderatus Columella in uh, De Re Rustica warned against constructing buildings near swampy places since there arise in these locations fl flying animalcules uh, possessing poisonous stings. <coughs> so you might say, well, that, that uh, he uh, rightly predicted the importance of, of uh, mosquitoes with malaria. Uh, but basically, it's along the same lines. And, and if you look at the literature that uh, Rich has collected um, uh, in the 16th century, that's the 1500s when that first book was published, 17th and 18th centuries, there were many others who postulated the, ex the uh, existence of disease-causing animalcules, little, little uh, animals. In uh, 1720, for example, Benjamin Martin, this was an English physician, wrote concerning the cause of tuberculosis, that it may possibly be some certain species of animalcula or wonderfully minute living creatures that by their peculiar your shape or disagreeable parts are inimical to our nature, but however capable of existing in our juices and vessels. Possibly being carried about by the air we draw into our lungs. Sounds like a pretty good description of the pathogenesis of tuberculosis, doesn't it? So this was in uh, 1720, almost a, a century before Crawford. Um, sent, it, 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 was, it was no less preposterous a theory uh, than Crawford's, and yet it was uh, popular enough so that uh, the book which contained this theory went into a sub second publication. Crawford, you will remember, uh, was only able to give one lecture. <laughs> so um, thus I would say that Crawford's theory was not new, and although it conflicted with orthodox teaching of humoral and atmospheric uh, uh, pathogenesis disease. It had both a historical support and a modicum of logic. Why couldn't he sell this theory? I believe there are several reasons. Uh, first of all, he promoted it relentlessly by denigrating the views of those who opposed it. Now, in the, uh, the copy of his lecture that Rich gave to me, this is a 50-page uh, lecture on natural history uh, he spends 40 pages in vain against the closed minds of physicians who opposed his theory. <laughs> you know, no wonder his fellow physicians were uh, offended by him. Uh, secondly, his writing, and likely also, and certainly his lectures, at least the one I read, uh, were the height of tortured prose. <laughs> when Rich turn, turned over the copy of this, this lecture to me, he says to me in his understated way, um, it's a difficult read. <laughs> <laughs> I picked this thing up and I'm, I'm trying to read to it. Um, it was like reading Ulysses. James Joyce says, Ulysses, you know, just a bunch of words. And I wonder, like, what the hell is going on here? Uh, what's he saying? Well, he's inveighing against you know, his fellow physicians. Um, so, um, and by, by the way, um, the, the title of this lecture is The Cause, Seat, and Cure of Diseases. It sounds straightforward and simple. I don't know how I could make it so difficult. <laughs> so here's just one example of his writings. And this was, a, this was in a letter he wrote to Benjamin Rush. And he's, uh, he's referring to a book that Rush has just published. So listen to this and try to follow it. Uh, this is two sentences. The subject must first be well considered, engage for a length of time the, the maturest reflection, and the numerous, numerous obstacles that offer to mind accustomed to a very different kind of reasoning must be dispassionately examined 
comma, before any de decision can be hoped for, period. To those whose minds are under a selfish influence and who from unworthy motives oppose whatever clashes with their views, no proofs would be satisfactory, but to such as are alone anxious to arrive at truth, a detail of cases from your sagacious and candid pen where no false covering could ever be assumed, and the undisguised face of nature would be exposed to view, the communication would have a value far above what it could be possible to appreciate it at. <laughs> That's a direct quote. I didn't make any of that up. Uh, and, and then finally, uh, Crawford preached investigation, but never did it any himself. Um, he, he did do some autopsies, um, but he never provided any scientific support for his theory. And that's not a great criticism, um, because uh, not many people were doing investigations in those days. Um, but that still is one of the reasons why he was unable to uh, sell his theory. Um, as such, uh, his support came entirely from his these limited observations during his work in the, uh, in the tropics, but also from uh, support from the uh, writings in the books that he had collected, which he quoted liberally. All right, so I'm ready to wrap it up. Um, so let's get back to Crawford. Is he a, um, is he a worthy member of uh, our institutions, Pantheon? of heroes. Uh, I believe he, in, in spite of some of the things I've said, I think he, he was. He was an extraordinary man, and certainly his collection was extraordinary. And he did not uh, conceive of the germ theory, as uh, has been written of him, nor did he have any real concept of the existence of microbes or the way in which they cause disease. There's no credible evidence that he introduced smallpox vaccination uh, in Baltimore much less the first in the country. Uh, 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 Deutsch, what was his first name? One of the, uh, no, he wouldn't know him, I'm sorry. He was a member of our Department of uh, Microbiology in 1964, uh, looked into this and pointed out that he did get uh, the uh, material from a uh, Dr. John Ring in London. At the same time, uh, Benjamin Waterhouse, who was in Cambridge, uh, got it. And uh, uh, Waterhouse inoculated many uh, citizens and published his results, whereas apparently uh, John Crawford uh, attempted to inoculate one person. It did not take. He never uh, mentioned it again. So um, he was not the first to introduce smallpox uh, vaccination in the country. Nor is it likely that his unpopular theory ruined his practice. Given the host of influential contacts he had to have had as the head of the Masons, the, uh, the founder of the Baltimore uh, uh, Bible Society, etc., there's no way he could have been uh, cut out of, of uh, the medical profession um, by the other physicians uh, with all those contacts. I would suggest it's more likely that with all these extracurricular responsibilities he had in these, these uh, societies, he had little time for his practice, and that what meager income he did generate was exhausted in the purchase of his collection. Now, I, I referred to what a tremendous bargain it was for the university to purchase this collection for $500. His daughter, in, in one letter, uh, says that um, a, uh, a collection of uh, books, there are 10 volumes by Sonini, uh, were purchased at that time for $300. So that was uh, $30 per volume. And that was, just, that was just one small group of what he had. So he spent an extraordinary amount of money uh, on that collection. And this time, and then Thomas Jefferson on his collection, which became the, uh, the uh, sort of founding collection of the Library of Congress. The Crawford founding collection of the uh, University of Maryland. Uh, system wide. Even so, he was a humanist and an extraordinary citizen of Baltimore. It, it uh, was, has been written that while he was serving in Barbados, uh, a hurricane 
uh, devastated the island. Uh, he uh, worked very hard uh, in uh, caring for citizens at that time, distributed his supply of medicines, his precious supply of medicines, according to need, without any uh, personal compensation. He was a, he was a humanist. And uh, he was a model citizen. Just go back to all those things that he organized and part participated in. And although he traveled but a short distance in understanding the pathogenesis of human disease, that is the relationship between infection, uh, insects and certain infections, at least he was headed in the right direction. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>